All right, today we're going to talk about the early Middle Ages in Europe. This goes along pretty well with uh, Chapter 13, Section 1 in Patterns of Interaction. There we go. Um, so, last time we left off Europe, um, we had seen the fall of Rome, especially the Western Empire, um, with all those Germanic tribes like the Visigoths, the Huns, the Vandals, etc. Um, and we saw the Eastern Empire. The Byzantine Empire is going to stay around for a while. Um, and that's kind of where we're coming at with, uh, with the start of the Middle Ages. You know, we talked about how the Middle Ages were a transition from the classical period um, of ancient Roman Greece to, um, well, something different. That's what we're going to try and figure out what that is. Um, so just look at a few key changes, just comparing Roman culture to the new Germanic culture that was coming in. Um, Rome, remember, was an urban society. A lot of people lived in cities, uh, and those cities were centers of trade. You look at Germanic culture, most of these people were rural. They're coming from the countryside, they're coming from small villages. Um, if they do trading, it's on a smaller scale, and it tends to be more individual. And they're mostly farmers, so most of their survival is coming from agriculture. Uh, Romans were educated. Most Romans, whether they lived in the city or the country, could read and write. Um, which was unusual for the ancient world. Uh, and no matter where you went in the Roman Empire, if you spoke Greek or Latin, you'd be understood. Meanwhile, Germanic culture was much more um, linguistically different. Uh, there wasn't a written language. They had to eventually adapt the Latin alphabet the Romans were using, um, and that's not going to be for a while. There's also no unified language. Um, you've got Gothic, you've got Vandal, you've got Frankish, all these different languages nothing really unifying them in terms of uh, language. It's not really an educated society. Um, in terms of government, Rome, remember, was a public state. Um, everybody in the Roman Empire was either a citizen or subject to a written code of laws. Um, if somebody robbed you, you would get the police, you would take them to court, and there'd be a trial with evidence, and the judge would sentence them. Germanic culture is much different. Uh, people weren't loyal to a state. They were loyal to their tribal chiefs, their families. Uh, the ties are very personal and traditional. If somebody robbed you in ancient Rome, you would go to your elders and have them solve it, or you'd get a gang together to go take back what was yours. Um, if you had a trial, uh, you might have a trial of, uh, say, fire, where both of you jump over a fire and whoever doesn't get burned must be right because God protected them. Uh, so it's much more religious and much less um, legal state. Um, there's not really a single state yet, although we'll see that change. So into all these changes, you have one tribe that is going to take power, and that is called the Franks. We talked about the Goths and the Vandals and the Huns. Um, the Franks will start to eclipse those other Germanic tribes by the 8th century. And they unified under a guy named Clovis. Two things to remember that Clovis did. One, he founded the Frankish kingdom. He takes all the Frankish tribes and puts them into one single kingdom. Um, so he unifies them. Secondly, he converts to Christianity. This is going to make him a powerful ally in Rome, where the Bishop of Rome, a.k.a. the Pope, is. And since Rome, recall, had become a Christian empire under Constantine, the remnants of the empire are still Christian. So um, converting to Christianity is going to make Clovis and the Franks some allies. Um, as time goes on, the actual role of the Frankish king declined. And the person who ends up seizing most of the power was an important royal advisor called the mayor of the palace. And the official job of the mayor of the palace was basically to manage the palace and the court of the king. But as time goes on, we start to see some weak Frankish kings. So the mayors took more and more power until eventually people even stop uh, listening to the king and they say go directly to the mayor of the palace. Two mayors of the palace we know by name. Uh, one was Charles Martel. In 732, the Abbasid Caliphate, which remember at that point um, was in Spain and North Africa, tried to push further into Europe uh, and into France. Um, this was kind of a potential turning point because Islam had expanded pretty rapidly across Africa um, and towards the Indus Valley in the east, and now they're moving further up into Spain uh, and into France. 
So Charles Martel brings the Frankish forces to southern France and defeats the Muslims at the Battle of Tours. Um, so we're not going to see France um, become Muslim, which is going to have a pretty major impact on future Europe. Um, that name Martel, by the way, is not a last name. It's actually a nickname. Uh, last names weren't that common among Germanic people, so Martel actually means the hammer, uh, since he knocked the Muslims out of Spain, or France. Uh, and then we have another mayor of the palace named Pepin the Short. Um, by the time Pepin is mayor of the palace, um, the kings are very weak, and pretty much everybody in Europe knows it. So Pepin actually writes a letter to the pope asking if he could just kick the king out and make himself king. Um, the pope told him he couldn't do that exactly, but he also kind of implied that nobody's going to miss the king. Um, and so soon the king is removed and Pepin appoints himself the new king uh, and starts a new dynasty. And the successor to Pepin, who only ruled uh, a short time, hence the name The Short, is going to be his son Charles. Um, Charles is probably one of the most important early Middle Ages um, rulers and figures. Um, and most commonly, he's known as Charlemagne, uh, which is from his name in early French. Um, so Charlemagne, as king, tried to continue what his father had done, expand the Frankish Empire, uh, Christianize his neighbors, make them convert. And then in the year 800, uh, the Pope invites Charlemagne to Rome. Um, and he invites them because they're getting overrun by another Germanic tribe. Um, so Charlemagne goes down there with an army, uh, defends Rome, kicks out the other tribe, and decides to stay for Christmas. And on Christmas Day, he's kneeling in mass when the Pope comes up and puts a crown on his head and declares that he is Emperor of the Romans. Now this is really important, um, symbolically. Keep in mind, there's no Roman Empire. So Emperor of the Romans doesn't sound like it means a lot. But he's taken the title of these great rulers from the past, like Constantine, like Caesar. Um, and essentially what the Pope is doing is giving official recognition to Charles or Charlemagne um, as the leader of Christians in the West. Uh, and that's a title that Charlemagne is going to use and help unify Western Europe. Um, and already by that point, Charlemagne was very widely respected. He was the son of Pepin, who was already a great king. Um, and most people in Western Europe, most of these other Germanic tribes, see Charlemagne as a leader. So the Pope making Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans, even with no Western Roman Empire, is uh, just going to add to his power. So Charlemagne enacts a series of reforms, um, pretty wide lasting. I'm going to give you a link at the end here that kind of outlines some of them. Um, but he was known for his love of education, so he's going to expand schools, not to the public, but he makes more official scholars and unifies them under a single language, Latin. Um, religiously, he expands Christianity, sometimes through force, um, and in particular because he was um, a follower of the Pope, it's going to be Catholic Christianity that's going to dominate in Western Europe. Um, militarily, he had seen that Muslims and uh, some of the other um, Eastern warriors tended to be guys on horseback with heavy armor. Um, he's going to take that idea and require the nobility to buy their own armor, pay for their own horses, which essentially makes this whole idea of knighthood, which we'll explore later. Um, but that's kind of a key idea that we're going to see in European warfare. Uh, economically, he starts using gold and silver currency across the whole of the Frankish Empire. And then politically, he starts some reforms to solidify his power. Um, so he's extremely influential as a ruler. Um, but when he dies, we kind of have a problem. Um, so in Rome, if somebody died, the property and inheritance would go straight to the eldest son. Well, that's not how the Franks did things. In the Frankish tradition, um, when a man died, his inheritance went to all of his sons. Charlemagne had three. Um, so quickly after Charlemagne's death, those three sons will start to fight each other for control of the Frankish Empire. Um, the war goes on for a little while until 843. They sign what's called the Treaty of Verdun, which divides the Frankish Empire into three parts. 
Um, that's going to sort of divide Charlemagne's legacy. But, you know, we still have a single language. We still have um, essentially now a, a dominant culture call across Western Europe. And this also starts what we call the Carolingian dynasty, which is going to be the dynasty that rules um, Western Europe for the next few hundred years. Um, after Charlemagne's sons died, the rest of that Carolingian empire collapses. Then in 936, we see a new state form in what's today Germany that calls itself the Holy Roman Empire. We're going to see this uh, entity around for the next uh, thousand years or so. Um, it's not really Roman, nor is it an empire, nor, as we'll see, was it particularly holy all the time. Um, but it was modeled kind of after Charlemagne's legacy. Um, they keep that title, Emperor of Rome, even though it's centered in Germany. And here you can see a map of what was the Frankish Empire uh, and ruled by Charlemagne's three sons. You had Charles the Bald in what is today France, uh, Lothar in northern Italy going all the way up to western Germany, and then Louis the German in um, what would today be eastern Germany and other parts of eastern Europe. All right, I promised you a link to look at, so here it is. Um, if you'll look at this URL right here, um, you'll find a handy page that describes how Charlemagne changed Europe. You can pause when you write it down. Um, that is pretty much all for today. Later, we will uh, look at how the church in Europe became really important in the Middle Ages. Uh, until then, email me if you have questions.